Hello, everybody. Chess expertise consists of patterns and chunks. You have to learn so many chunks and patterns to become a great player in chess. And we should study our openings this way. We should rely on those recurrent and important patterns and we should understand them deeply by asking the why questions. So today I will show you very typical Sicilian patterns that you must know if you're taking that great opening with black. Should we trade or should we avoid the trade? That's the first question that will initiate our episode today, folks. I will show you several very important patterns, but I will explain them to you by nice breakdowns and hopefully you will understand them and you can apply them in your games. But how did we come to that position? It came from a Kalashnikov variation of the Sicilian, okay? So e5 is the Kalashnikov and then goes d6. Then we go a6 to chase away the knight and then we go for a5. That's the basic advantage of not moving the knight to f6 yet. So we have this f5 break on the board, takes takes and bishop d3, right? So this can come from different orders, but I want you to focus on the trade and explain to yourself why or why not we should trade off those bishops, okay? Now, the good move is bishop e6, guys. Why? Because the bishop is a border guard of the key weakness on d5. We are talking about the key d5 outpost in this episode, right? We will discuss the importance of it. This can come from several Sicilians. d5 is an outpost because no black pawn can control that square. Thus, the bishop needs to act like a border guard of that weakness. That's why we are preserving the bishop, the light square bishop, our good bishop, and we avoid the trade while also we also control this d5 outpost. A very logical move. I want you to ask yourself the why question to really deeply engage with this. And then, of course, the, the, the game goes like this, not f6. Another move that actually guards d5. White wants to improve their poor knight, we castle. And now I'll actually come to a very interesting moment as well. Rook e8 is designed to improve our worst place piece. That's another typical Sicilian idea, folks. That was our bad bishop. So black is just transforming that piece to this nice diagonal, okay? That's another typical pattern to know as a Sicilian player. Now, every single piece is doing a function. This rook is nice because you opened the f-file before, right? Our bishop is nicely covering that d5 outpost and we take it from there. And here, if white goes knight d5, folks, that would be a very typical error from the white's perspective. Tell me how we should react to this move. I'm sure you will face this move many times. If they move to d5, we will take with the bishop first and then we will force them to fill an outpost square with a pawn. And that clearly favors black. All else being equal, this trade favors black. Because by taking back with the pawn, black nullifies the outpost on d5. From now on, no white piece can use that outpost on d5. And our d6 weakness is also not a weakness anymore, right? Just look at this. Until here, this d6 pawn was relevant because white could put pressure on that weakness on d5, right? But after this trade, this weakness on d6 is not exploitable. So these things are also in black's favor in this position, okay? And of course, you will take it from there. You can just go to d4, for example, and you get this beautiful outpost for yourself. And obviously, after knight d5, after takes, if they take back with the knight, we still take on d5, and then we achieve this position. Beautiful knight on d4. And if they take on d4, we come to a different Sicilian pattern, namely the middle game with opposite color bishops. And our bishop is the king of the board, folks. That's a very typical thing in most Sicilians that white's light square bishop is not the best piece in the world, especially when there's a pawn on d5, right? Like this bishop is limited by the pawn, basically. And uh, our bishop is just shooting on the weaknesses and just a great piece. So we can outplay white in those middle games. Now let's look at the Shveshnikov decision, right? So the first example was Kalashnikov. Now we are looking at the Shveshnikov structure. The question is, should we trade those bishops or should we do something else? What's the best move for black? How would you treat this position with the black pieces? Folks, I think the most logical move is bishop e6 in this position because our bishop is still functioning like a border guard of the key d5 outpost and we are inviting white to exchange on our own terms, right? 
you should always generally always welcome such a pawn on e6 because despite being double pawns on the e-file this pawn is a beautiful pawn that is just chasing away that important knight from d5 controlling that key central square plus opening up our rook that's a beautiful exchange for black so that's a very logical and also recurrent pattern in the sicilian generally when there's an outpost on d5 then you invite exchanges on your own terms if you take on h3 right now obviously right no one can chase away that knight on d5 and white can later right intensify the pressure on d6 and let's say this is a worse version for black to play than the version with bishop e6 and obviously white maybe shouldn't take on e6 but then right your bishop will always right disturb the white pieces maybe sometimes you can take here you can go there you keep the tension that's the point since this trade is always favoring black folks another sicilian pattern regarding the d5 outpost okay the knight on a4 the knight on a4 is far away from the d5 outpost folks it's black to play i will give you two choices white just played a3 should we take on a3 here or should we go a5 two choices okay and while you're deciding on this on these moves please notice one thing a recurrent pattern the knight on a4 is far away from this key outpost on d5 and how does that shape your decision of a5 or b takes a3 we are forming connections yes folks we go a5 that's a great move because if white takes we take and we will never allow knight c3 to d5 that knights want to go back to the game asap and jump on that outpost on d5 we don't allow that that's the key right there's a direction in our pawn play pawns and pieces they're always connected pawn play and piece activity is always connected sicilians you should never forget about this knight on a4 that was about to jump to c3 for example if you take on a3 takes back and the knight is just in time even though there's a pawn to be taken the knight goes back bishop d5 obviously right because white wants to get a knight on d5 that's a beautiful trade for white by the way folks you should not allow this in general yeah because white will exchange off your border guard bishop and eventually get a good knight versus bad bishop middle game and of course sicilian players you must avoid generally those kind of middle game positions let's say i've just put on the board yeah you don't want to allow this in general right your bishop is a bad piece because the central pawn is blocked on the same square and obviously this knight on d5 is just an excellent piece no one can chase away that knight anymore and you don't want to go to this this kind of positions in general and this explains right now reverse engineering our way back this knight is so far away from d5 and we want to keep it that way by going a5 in this position we keep talking about the d5 square and issues around d5 because that's a very common pattern very typical recurrent thing in most sicilians kalashnikov shiveshnikov Nidor, all these things right they will feature this black to play folks can you please tell me how we should play with the black pieces form a plan please with the black pieces you're a great player if you came up with the move knight f6 first chasing the queen from d5 and what's our next move folks bam obviously the recurrent pattern in the sicilian the d5 pawn break just look at the effect of this move by pushing d5 we are getting rid of our weakness on d6 no more backward pawn plus we put pressure in the center plus we nullify the outpost on d5 right so until here there's an outpost on d5 if you give time to white he will do this knight c2 knight b4 knight d5 right so you're also by going d5 you're eliminating you're liquidating a weak square just look at the multi-purposeness of this break obviously every sicilian schoolboy must know about the strength of such moves and we will never miss a chance to play such moves if the opponent gives us a chance and here we create our own chances yeah first we chase the queen away and then we go d5 everything is perfect our king is safe perfect timing for the push d5 in fact after d5 takes takes black is already better because black is a central pawn and this pawn is nicely burying that knight on e2 beautiful knight open the d file great pieces okay more on this kind of positions later on another question here folks should black go d5 or not in this position a very typical Nidorf position and the decision is yours please judge whether d5 is a good move or not in this position folks in this position d5 is not good why 
because that's a premature pawn break. Our king is still in the center. That's not the right timing for d5. And I will show you why. Because white will take, you will take back, they will take, you will take back. And even though you go to this endgame, okay? It looks like, okay, your king is in the center, but you're reaching an endgame. The problem is this. They will castle long and they will hit your bishop. They will disturb your pieces because white is ahead in development. They will keep disturbing our pieces. And after bishop e6 in this position, they will make a very good move with knight c5 folks. And knight c5, and again, another disturbing move. They are disturbing the bishop. They are disturbing the pawn. And just look at this, right? It's a, it's a very nice version for white because takes takes and white gains the bishop pair. White got long-term advantages as a result of taking initiative, attacking stuff all the time, and we were just not in time to consolidate our position. And this is a pattern that must be known by serious Sicilian players. D5 is a great strategic pawn break, but the timing is wrong. The timing is wrong. And now you're talking about time in chess, obviously, right? We are talking about chess principles. And this is also how it got punished. If you take back with the bishop, by the way, then white will also hit that piece as soon as possible by castling long. And you understand, right? Queen f2, they will disturb our queen. They will invite moves like knight bishop b6. And again, white is using their leading development to disturb us. Folks, Sicilian is full of resources. Sometimes it's inevitable. There's a knight coming to d5. You have to allow a knight on d5. And there are still very nice ways to play around that knight. I will show you in this pattern the importance of the C file and also one pawn break that must be known by heart. Okay? So in this position, knight c3 is on the board. And can you tell me a very logical move for black, right? We cannot avoid this move, but we can anticipate it with the move rook c8, obviously, right? We place our rook on a semi-open file. And now we're also talking about the recurrent pattern here, the backward pawn on c2. That's a very nice pressure that our rook is inducing and also freezes that knight for the moment. You have to go to d5 because then you will take on c2. That's a very nice multi-purpose move. Queen e2. They must guard c2 to be able to play knight d5. Then we play rook c4, folks. Another multi-purpose move. We want to double up on the c file while also putting pressure on the weak pawn on e4. That's another recurrent pattern in Sicilian. Usually when white goes f4, f5, right, that pawn on e4 becomes a target. And we will hit that pawn while also, in other multi-purpose, intensify the c-file pressure. Now they go knight e5, folks, okay? And we make a very natural move, rook c8, obviously, right? Another move that defends our rook, but also hits the weakness on c2, which forces c3. And now comes the next move. Can you please stop the video? and find Black's very strong next move, folks. You're a great Sicilian player if you found the move f5. Bam! That's how you undermine that strong knight on d5. Look at the beauty of this. You love knight d5, but you're undermining the support of that piece by this very recurrent and nice f5 pawn break. And here things are collapsing because there's a big, big threat. Rook takes e4. How can white stop that? You cannot take on f5 because your knight is hanging. There is no knight fork in this position that your knight can throw at us because I just take your knight on b6, right? So, after f5, things are really, really going on in black's favor, right? So, this example shows us typically nice things. We learn two things from this, going back, right? Going back, we learn two very important things in Sicilians. The c-file pressure, the weakness of the e4 pawn, actually three things, plus the move f5 folks plus the move f5 right in this position so sometimes you know single examples like this can teach us three very important concepts in sicilian and that's why i chose this position because of its simplicity because it's so clean we understand the basic points so nicely in a position like this even though the knight looks amazing at first sight there are ways to live with that that's why you should trust the sicilian resources folks that's a great opening with black if you want to play for a win. Another Sicilian pattern, folks, very important thing to understand when they advance with a five early in the middle game, when white signals that they will attack us on the king's side with moves like g4, g5, right? Because white's pawn chain is pointing towards the king's side. They want to play on that side of the board. It looks like it's a big bind right now for black and white also gains some space on the queen's side. But Sicilian is full of resources, folks. 
I want you to take a step back here and find a great plan for black. Notice that the white king is still in the center. That will give you an idea of a move here with black that's so explosive and so nice. You're a great player if you found the move. Bam, d5, another d5, right? That's why I structured today's video around d5 square, folks. It's the key square in Sicilian. There are so many plans around that. And this is a nice counter punch. That's the name of it. You are hitting the white in the center. They are advancing on the flanks. They are signaling an attack on the flank. And you respond right from the center. That's the spirit of a counter-attacking opening like Sicilian. A very common team. E takes d5. What's your next move, folks? What is the next move? The king is in the center. Yes, e4. A beautiful awakening move that opens up the e-file by force. Take, take. And then you go. What's the next move? First hit the bishop. And then goes... Well, that's my question. White wants to castle short. Can you find that multi-purpose move, folks, that stops White's intentions? Bishop c5. Amazingly beautiful move. Multi-purpose. The bishop stops the king from casting short. Plus, you open the file for your rook. That's Sicilian counterplay for you in its purest forms. That's how you disturb the white pieces and you punch them in the center of the board. Black is already much better after bishop c5. All these moves are coming. I will recapture on d5 and look at your king. You're suffering in this position. Look at your bishop that is a tall pawn basically over there. Going back, folks. If you didn't play d5, you would face difficult. I will also show you that. But since d5 is on the board, that's a beautiful moment to play. Of course, after knight takes d5, it's the same thing, right? You go e4, after this, knight f6, bishop c5. They will transpose, basically. So d5 is a great, great, great break. Also, you put pressure on center. You can take on f5, knight c5s are coming. You disturb them, right, in the center. If you didn't play like that, if you just continue with normal moves like b6, white will consider making a move like g4, right? And if you take that pawn, which is a mistake, then comes rook g1, and you see what's going, right? As I told you, white is attacking us on the king's side, and this looks very dangerous. I mean, look at your king, look at the g7 pawn. You don't want to play this way, right? All the pieces are coming, queen h5s are coming, and that's what white does to you in the middle games, yeah? Because they have better prospects in this f5 structures on the king's side, obviously, yeah? And then, of course, you have to play this position, but it's not fun. Let me tell you, it's not fun. Bishop c4. And the game is already over, right? I mean, this is a big threat. Queen g8. And how do you stop that? If you move the knight, then you get mated on the g7 square, right? The game is basically over. So you have to be very careful, right? So that's the that's why we should also understand things like this. You know, what's the cost of not playing d5? Well, that's the cost. They will attack you on the king's side. So this way you also consolidate your, your learning, right? You're actually asking the why questions here. What's the function of this move? That also connects to our central pawn majority. Yeah, that's the, usually the case in the Sicilian. We have a central pawn majority. And that's why d5s are a great way to exploit your extra pawn in the center. White always says to watch out for moves like d5. Explosive central counterpunch move that disturbs white. Another typical Sicilian pattern, folks. And I'm sure many of you spot instantly with the black pieces here. It's black to move. That's a game of Gary Kasparov. What should black do? If you're a Sicilian player, if you've seen this pattern before, I'm sure it just sticks like, like uh, from the background, like instantly. You will see this move instantly, basically, without any effort. Folks, I am talking about the rook takes c3 sacrifice. That's a typical Sicilian exchange sack that you should play this move even without much calculation. What's the point of this? You basically shatter the pawn structure around the white king. The white king becomes naked and lonely. And you'll obviously put more pieces later on, on the queen side, and you will intensify your attack. This is a great move that, as I said, it's not based so much about pure calculation because there's no forced win for black, but the game plays itself for black from here. It becomes easier to organize an attack on the queen side from this position. That's a typical Soviet sack. There's even a name for this. And this works in most Sicilian structures. If that knight is lacking support, if that knight is, for example, lacking support from peace or a knight on e2, right? It's almost always a good thing if the king have castled 
the queen side. Obviously, there are exceptions. I'm talking about general patterns, general trends. You should at least consider this as a serious possibility. Sometimes this also works even if the king is on the king side, by the way, right? Because again, that knight is a nice piece as I talk about d5 outposts and so on. So it makes sense to remove that knight, especially in a position like this. And look how Kasparov plays this position. Just takes his time. Queen c7, slowly he will bring pieces to the queen's side. He first castles his king, right? g5, he doesn't mind. You see, he has no phantom fears because it will still take a long time for white to organize an attack on the king's side with moves like this. And he's trusting that his attack will come first because also a very typical pattern, right? Now, things are clear. We know exactly what both sides are doing, right? Kings castle on opposite flanks. So it's all about attack, timing, dynamism that will decide this game, right? Whose attack will land first? And basically, Black's bet is this. Because of those weaknesses, my attack will come first. And that's a Sicilian pattern that you must know by heart. Okay, h4, not a4, as I said. Slowly, pieces are moving in that direction. White wants to defend, but there are knight on e5, for example. Another great piece, putting pressure here. Maybe knight c4s are there. h5, obviously, white has to attack, create something on the king's side. Comes d5. Another very typical Sicilian pawn break. Why? Because of the bishop, right? That's, an, that's a pawn move that awakens the bishop on b7. This bishop was shooting on the wall of pawns. And you're also, by the way, by playing d5, you're also activating the other bishop, right? Now talking about pawn play for piece activity. A very typical d5 break. We were talking about d5 moves today, so that's a nice connection. Queen h2, well, bishop d6. Gary simply puts pressure on the queen. And then comes queen h3. And here comes... Nice phase. You take the bishop first and then you can stop the video here, folks. And can you please find that move by Gary that awakened the rook on a fate and basically intensified Black's play on the queen's side. It's not take on c3 because if you take on c3, they will take back. And after queen takes c3, bishop b2, the bishop becomes a good piece. You don't want that, right? You want your initiative to intensify in this position. And then comes Gary's move, b4, bam. A clearance pawn sacrifice. He simply wants to open up the c-file. Yeah, That's a beautiful move. And now rook c2. As I said, black's attack is coming first. And that's all it counts in a position like this. It's not the extra exchange that white has, but whose attack will land first. It's all about the king's safety, folks. King a1, well, he has to avoid queen c2 check, obviously. But then comes Gary's next move. He looks at this bishop e5 move. It looks like a winning move, right? It looks like a winning move except for d4. Please visualize it, this folks. That's a beautiful calculation exercise. Bishop e5 check, d4, and it doesn't work for black. So Gary finds another move to disrupt white's defenses. And he finds the move bishop takes e4. That's a beautiful derived move. He derives this move by looking at bishop e5 idea first. And obviously, if you take back my bishop, then bishop e5, and things are collapsing. Look, let's look how this line will finish, by the way. Knight e4 is the only move, let's say. But then comes, can you see it? Takes, takes. And how can black finish off the game, folks? Yes, it's mate in two. Bam, the queen sacrifice. And now you see the point, right? Why he opened the C file, the function of that knight on a4, and the king's safety. Very nice, of course. So that's why Gary sees this. That's why he takes on e4. And now the bishop is awakened. Look at our pieces. We have five great pieces. And look at white pieces. Whose attack is starting first? That's all it counts. And obviously, white tries Desperado g6, but Gary takes on h1. His king is very safe. Now there are moves like this. I just like this. And white cannot hold this position anymore. King f8, nice. He's using this pawn as a shield, as an umbrella. I will talk more about these things later on. Yeah, so this pawn is actually covering the black king. And nice calculation exercise also here, folks. Rook b8. He's now going for the final action. The threat is bishop c3 check after takes, takes. And things are collapsing for black on the king side, queen side. So he tried bishop b2. But then comes Gary's move, knight takes b2. You cannot really capture my knight. So white tried one final trick of forking the king and the queen. And here Gary says, please, go ahead, do that. And he takes the rook on d1. He allows the queen to drop. But then comes this little move, folks. And black 
wins by force. That's an amazing game by Gary Kasparov, folks. But you see, he even called the white player a chess tourist here because he allowed black to sacrifice on c3. I know that's a very insulting word to call someone chess tourist because his, his opponent was 2,600 player. He was a very strong player. He just moved the queen from d2 to f2, allowed Gary to sack on c3, which he did, of course, without much thinking, and the game played itself. So that's why, you know, patterns like this should be known by heart. Chess expertise mostly relies on those patterns and chunks that you must accumulate. You must learn by looking at those examples, because once you do that, it doesn't take much calculation and time to find a great move like rook takes c3. Let's conclude today's episode with this homework position, folks. It's black to play. What should black do in this position? A typical Sicilian middle game on the board. Give me an idea. Maybe two or three moves in a row. How would you play with the black pieces here? Folks, this was only the first part. I will make another video on the second part of those typical Sicilian patterns that you must know. That's how we should start learning and opening, right? General plans, general ideas, recurrent middle game plans, and why those moves are played. Because if you do that, then even though you don't memorize move by move, you can still make the right decision in the middle game, right? That's a function of studying openings like this, connecting it to middle game, connecting it even to sometimes to end games, right? For Sicilian, of course, in those structures, e5 and d6 pawns, d5 is the key square. And today's episode focused on the d5 square most of the time. We saw how we can avoid the trade to keep our good bishop, how we can fight against knight on d5, how we can put pressure on the c-file, the backward pawn on e4, right? Always relevant weaknesses. And then we also saw how we go for Soviet sack in the middle game to exploit our advantage on the queen side, weaknesses, and the recurrent pawn breaks to activate our pieces, right? All these plans, exchanges, pawn play, weaknesses, right? That's how you're judging. That's how you're building an understanding of those recurrent patterns because every single game will feature exchanges, pawn play to awaken or limit the enemy pieces, right? That's why that should be the basic guideline of our opening study. This position, black to play, Please give me ideas on YouTube. If you like this video, please give me a like and subscribe. That's very important for me to be able to produce similar content. I'm doing it, folks, to help you improve your game. I truly believe in this way of learning openings. And I can make more videos about different openings, maybe French, maybe Catalan, you know, five patterns to remember and know in the French or Catalan or neither or other structures, right? Maybe that we should also form a series about this. Give me feedback. Do you like this format? Do you like this format? Should I do more of similar videos? And I will catch you on the next episode following up with those typical Sicilian patterns, folks. Bye-bye.